motor loop control is the basal ganglia loop that controls all movement except for eye movements. Remember that eye movements are not controlled by primary motor cortex, they're controlled by frontal eye fields. And there is a ocular motor loop that goes through the basal ganglia that is concerned with eye movements. But we're going to look at the skeletal motor loop and then apply what we learned uh, from that to the other loops, that, including the ocular motor loop. So the skeletal uh, motor loop, there is a lot of input to it. So a lot of it is, is what you could call efferent's copy. It's essentially information from the cerebral cortex about the action that is currently happening. And that action that is currently happening is favored. So, the, so in the absence of any other reason, if there's no other bid for the muscles of the body, for the, for the motor plant of the body, then the action that one is engaged in right now will continue. Uh, so uh, that gives rise to what I would call behavioral inertia. Okay, so here's, here's behavioral inertia. This is my cat, Minnie, and six seconds later, that's her. She's doing the same thing. This is a, a, a heron um, that I watched, and six minutes later, it's doing much the same thing. The same action is, is uh, favored, uh, and so one moment gets stitched to the next mo moment by this type of behavioral inertia. The input to the striatum the cortical input to the striatum, it comes from everywhere. And so what is getting funneled into the striatum are, are sensory experiences interpreted by the, the cerebrum. So this is really different from what happens in, this, in, the, uh, in the cerebellum where you're, the cerebellum gets inf sensory information that's very close to the original sensory, uh, to the sensory origin. Um, whereas this is sensory information that has been massaged and interpreted by the cerebral cortex is reaching the basal ganglia, is reaching the striatum. In addition, there are, are memories. Memories come from all over the, the, the neocortex. There are um, uh, emotional uh, uh, interpretations, and, and there's a sense of saliency and of valence. Saliency, how important is this to me? What's the, what's the comparison between going to get something to eat versus going to sleep? Which is more salient right now? Am I exhausted or am I really, really hungry and not as tired? Uh, which has more saliency? And then there's the valence. The valence is the good or the bad. I can see a glass of water and at one point that might look like the best thing in the world. I'm completely dehydrated. That water is just, having a clear glass of water just is the most wonderful thing I can imagine. And another time, uh, I, 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 I feel waterlogged and I don't want that at all. Uh, uh, the same entity can have different valence. And at one point, uh, before having food poisoning, I love this food, but after food poisoning, I can't stand that food. The fa valence can change with experience as well. It can change by condition, it can change by valence, I mean by um, experience. So the uh, basal ganglia is going to get information about all of that, and it's going to use that information to choose the, uh, the action. So there are the the sensory the skeletal motor loop involves three basic uh, processes, each of which is supported by a different pathway. Uh, so, in a starting condition, and the, and what I've graphed here is the amount of movement on the y-axis and on the x-axis is a categorical uh, rep a representation of categorical types of movements. So these are all the movements that are possible. And at one moment in time, I may be walking and chewing gum, all right? So I've got these two, they're both chunks, so I can do them both at the same time. Um, uh, and, and now, all of a sudden, I see, I see a friend. So maybe I decide that what I'm gonna do is stop and talk. I'm gonna talk. 
and I'm going to initiate an action. Well, the first thing that happens is that I have to stop what I'm doing, okay? So it's much, much easier to, to start an action from ground zero than to m morph directly from one action and, and get to a different action. All right, so you use this hyperdirect pathway, which we'll look at, um, that stops movement broadly. And then the direct pathway initiates action. It's going to release the chosen action from the, the wet blanket of suppression that is the default condition that the basal ganglia puts out. And finally, it's going to use uh, uh, these indirect pathways to fine-tune the selected action, get rid of these competing, these rival actions, so you get a nice selective release of one action and the, and the neighboring actions are, are suppressed, okay? So that's, that's where we're learning, that's where we're heading. And another way to think about this is, is just, just think about the action of speaking. If I look, if I uh, see an old friend, but I haven't seen the friend for a while and, and my memory is not the best in the world, and I look at that person, I say, hi, and it's, and I say, I start to say Larry, but um, in the middle, I realize that the person's name is, is Leonard or Le Lenny. So it, is it easier for me to say Le Lenny? It, can I, is it easier for me to go L-A and then morph over to any? Or is it easier for me to say Larry, oh, Lenny? It's much easier to stop and restart than it is to change in the middle. And that is, I think, the uh, importance of the hyperdirect pathway. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna just step through each one of these pathways.